So one of the primary focuses when you were a kid, what was that one goal when you were a kid, you were on the playground when you got sent off to school? Do you remember this uh, when you were a kid? What was like, this is what you needed to do. This is what you need to do. And you may not have the same mind as I'm thinking right now, so I probably shouldn't ask the question. But what you should be thinking and the way you'd answer if you knew my brain right now, you'd say, I want to make friends, right? That's what kids all want to do. Like when you're a kid and you're on the playground, you're like, oh, I just, like that's your primary focus is I want to make friends. I want to fit in, right? I, I want to make sure that, you know, I like Jimmy on the playground. Jimmy likes the swings, but I haven't talked to Jimmy yet, so I, I don't know, right? So that's the focus when you're a kid is you, you want to make friends, right? Your, your parents, they ask you, it's like they pick you up from school and they ask you, uh, did you make any friends today, right? You ever been asked that question when you were a kid? You guys remember that, right? That's this primary goal of when you're like five years old. Like our goals today are so different than uh, what the five-year-old had when they were on the playground. They wanted to make friends, And it was seen as like, you know, the guy in the corner who did nothing and twiddled his thumbs, like that was kind of the loner that you didn't want to hang out with, right? It's like, I'm sorry to call you out if that was you, but you should have been making friends at five years old, all right? No, just kidding. So God, (laughs) your friendships, right? Your friendships. That's what people, when you were a kid, like that's what you really cared about. Like that was so important was your friendships, is finding finding friends. And uh, the reason why I think that is the case is because God designed us to be relationable people. He designed us to be in relationships. He designed us to have these friendships. It's what he wants us to do. He doesn't want us to be alone. He doesn't want us to be isolated. He wants us to have friendships. He wants us to be in relationships. We've been told by so many sources that what's the importance of friendships? Like why, why, do, we, why do we need friendships? Why do we want friendships? You know, and we're told uh, it's for your own good. It's for your mental health, right? It, we're told it's for your happiness. It's for your joy. It's, uh, you know, so you can fit in. It's so you can relate. You can grow social skills, which is all true, right? Those are all good things, maybe aside from the mental health thing. But, like, it's all a good thing, right, to, to make these, these friends. But God has a different, higher understanding of what friendships are all about. He has a, a, a more pointed and a bigger and a better focus for what friendships are are for. And friendships are really uh, vital in the Christian life. And really one of the most important resources for getting the gospel out into the world for gospel advancement is, is friendships, it's people. And Paul gives us this so clearly in his letter to the Philippians in, in chapter 1 as we look at verses 1 through 11 in this first section uh, of our first installment of this series of joyful contentment that is entitled Gospel-Centered Friendships. Uh, Paul helps us understand this, this higher uh, understanding, this higher purpose of friendships, what friendships are for. And really, he talks about relationships, but he calls them his gospel partners throughout, as we'll see here as we go through this text. But before we even dive into the text, I want to help you understand what the book of Philippians is all about. Okay, so what is Philippians all about? Why did Paul write this letter? So we have to dive into that before we can kind of understand the context, so that we can understand why I called this whole series Joyful Contentment. Why is it called Joyful Contentment? Well, let's, let's think about this. So Philippians, uh, just to give you context on the history of the city, the city was established in the 4th century BC, and it was actually established by Philip of Macedon, who is the father of Alexander the Great, which I thought was pretty interesting, where this city was established, but it didn't even become a Roman province. It didn't become a Roman colony, actually not a province, but a colony until uh, the second century uh, BC. And when it became a colony uh, in the second century, it was heavily influenced by uh, by Rome's, by Rome's uh, uh, politics. So there was a lot of citizens that were uh, very political, if you will. They were very uh, proud of their Roman citizenship in Philippi in the second century. So that was super important to them. So fast forward, you know, 250 years when Paul writes this letter in 60 AD, and he's writing this letter from, uh, from Rome in prison. He's imprisoned, and this, that's why it's called one of the prison epistles, okay? So he writes to the, the church of Philippi, And this church was established um, probably 10 years before he wrote the letter. And this was Paul's first church that he established in Europe, 
okay? So he established this church uh, in Europe, the first church, and it was in this, this infancy. In fact, in Acts chapter 16 is where we hear this account of uh, the, the missionary, um, not the missionary, but the, uh, the gospel reaching this area. And Lydia is one of the first converts in uh, Acts chapter 16 in Philippi. And this is where the, the, the new, brand new, newborn church, they would meet because Lydia was a seller of purple goods. She was very wealthy. So they would meet in her big and spacious home uh, because it required about 10 or so men to start a synagogue in a particular city. And they didn't have that yet in the church. So in its infancy, it was meeting in this well-off woman's home. And then, of course, over as the years expanded, it grew as the gospel uh, went on and went forward into that, that region. So Paul is writing uh, with joyful contentment. He's writing this letter with joyful contentment as he's sitting there in prison. That's the helpful context for us as we think about this letter. He's, he's sitting in prison, and now prison is not like, it wasn't horrific. This, I mean, he got he, he was hanging out with Timothy, right? He, he had guests, he, he had his parchments, and he had uh, people could come and, and bring him gifts and things like that. Uh, so it wasn't horrific, but it wasn't great either. Like Paul didn't have the freedom to do the things he wanted to do, right? He couldn't go out and share the gospel uh, as a you know, missionary heart that he had. He, he was limited in so many different ways, but uh, he was still able to write these letters to, to these churches. So he writes this letter to Philippi with a few things in mind. In fact, I, I've mentioned this before, but there's more themes in the book of Philippians than there are chapters. There's so much that we can learn from this, this short four-chapter letter. Uh, but the primary themes, as Paul starts with, is this, this gratitude that he has for people. This gratitude and this thankfulness that he has for not only people, but the people that have um, uh, partnered with him for the purpose of the gospel, which is what our sermon is about tonight. But then he also goes into this uh, focus on uh, this theme of unity because the, the Philippians were lacking in love for one another and unity. Uh, so he, he goes into this focus of, of developing unity. And then he also writes the letter to tell the Philippian church that Epaphroditus, who had grown sick and they got word that he grew sick, uh, that he's doing fine. He's good, guys. Don't worry about it. We're good. We're with Timothy. He got Epaphroditus. He's all good. And then the last major uh, reason for writing the letter is because the uh, Philippian church sent him this great gift uh, to support his ministry, and he's basically writing a thank you letter to them saying, thank you so much for partnering with me, not only in sharing the gospel and where you're at, but in uh, fueling my ministry financially, right? So these are the core reasons why Paul writes this letter to this small church in uh, Philippi. So with all of that in mind, let's look at the text together, okay? Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Reading from the English Standard Version. It says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Uh, so this is not to say that the, the letter is from Timothy, it's from Paul, uh, but Timothy was with him in prison, okay? Servants, slaves of Christ Jesus. So it's important to think about that word doulos there. Uh, the, that's our relationship with Christ. It's supposed to be a... a uh, um, a full-on surrender and commitment to Christ. And Paul loves that term of uh, his, his servanthood to Christ Jesus. goes on, to all the saints, holy ones, set-apart ones, in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. I just want to note this really quick. These are the two offices, if you will, that are in the church. Overseers is used um, synonymously with uh, the other, the, you know, with the office of pastor. So you have elder, you have bishop, which is this one, overseer, and then you have, um, I'm trying to think of that third word. Uh, you have bishop, you have elder, and you have pastor. I'm forgetting the third word. I probably should know that. But anyways, they're synonymous throughout the New Testament for the same office of elder, okay? So we see these two categories of deacon and pastor. And I think that's important to note uh, because those are the two offices that are the church, um, how the church functions. Deacons are servants. Then you have the pastors who are, of course, leading the church, okay? Verse two, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse three, I thank you, or I thank my God, rather, in all my remembrance of you. Verse four, always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy. Okay, I love the English Standard Version, okay? I do, but it's, it's very... Uh, direct from the Greek. So let's read that again and help and, and 
you'll understand why I'm trying to slow down. Always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. Like, what does that mean? Okay, the NIV is a lot more helpful in this, okay? This is what Paul's saying. It says in the NIV, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Makes a little bit more sense. Sometimes the ESV with the Greek, because it's a very literal translation, can get a little clunky. So, in all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy. So, Paul is regularly praying for the Philippian church joyfully because he loves them. I mean, there's like almost every other letter he writes, it's, it's like full of rebuke. Philippians, he's like, good job, guys. You're doing awesome. Encouragement, encouragement, encouragement. Okay, verse 5. Why is he joyful? Well, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And that's through that financial gift, as I mentioned. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you <clears throat> will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That's a sermon in itself. So I won't dive too deeply in there, but it's it, helpful to point out a few things here. And I'm sure of this, that he who began, who is that? We're talking about God. God begins the salvation conversion. He's the one who changes the heart of the person. It's not us who choose God. It's God who chooses us, changes our heart. And then we're capable of choosing God. So that's what we see here, I, that he, he began the good work and he will bring it to completion. So the sanctification process is a, it's a monergist or it's a synergistic process it's between both of us. But if God was not involved in that process, we would all apostatize. We would all leave the faith, right? But God is thankfully sustaining us and sanctifying us and growing us. And he's the one that is, uh, will bring us to that, the day of Jesus Christ, the ultimate salvation where we die and we go into glorification. Okay, I know there's a lot of theology there. It's not even necessary for our sermon, but helpful to at least dissect that a little bit, okay? And Paul's talking about uh, this because he cares for the salvation of the people, ultimately, of the Philippian church. Verse 7. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace. Partakers is this uh, fellowship, this idea of fellowship, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Because when you're imprisoned in ancient first century time, uh, there was like this, this social stigma that came with that. People didn't want to uh, interact with you. You know, you're, it's kind of like you, oh, you're in prison. Like, I don't want to talk to you anymore type of thing. Uh, but the Philippian church didn't do that. They knew he was imprisoned for the sake of the gospel. And instead, they, they partnered with him and they continued to support him despite the fact that he went into prison. So Paul is very um, gra uh, grateful for what they have done. Verse 8, For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer. So Paul starts this three-verse prayer for the people. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, that they grow in their love of Christ with their mind, so that you may approve what is excellent, so what is good, what is right, and so be pure and blameless for the, day, uh, for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So uh, ultimately what we're talking about here is Paul desperately wants the sanctification of the Philippian church. He's praying faithfully for these people that have partnered with him in the gospel, for these people that he loves dearly. He wants them to grow in Christ. That's, his, that's what he's praying for. Right? He's like, thank you guys for everything that you did everything that you're doing, continue to do it, please. And also I'm praying for you, right? This is the first section uh, that we're looking at tonight. And the main idea that I want you to draw out of this, this sermon is that I really want you to appreciate your godly friends that strive alongside you with, for the sake of the gospel. That's the main idea. I want you to walk away with a deeper appreciation of all of these people who love Christ, that are in your circle, that are striving alongside you, in getting the gospel forward, moving the gospel forward, reaching people for Christ. That's the main idea of this. So notice, as we look at our verses for the first point here, notice how Paul talks about the people in Philippi, right? He loves them. He genuinely cares for these people. And he's so grateful to God for all of the good things that they've done in their partnership in the gospel, so point number one, simple as this, you got to praise God for giving you godly friends. Praise God for giving you godly friends. 
I think sometimes we take this for granted, right? Instead, we ought to cherish the people that God has put into our circles. Cherish these friendships that you have that love Christ and know Christ and want other people to know Christ. Praise God for the people that he has surrounded you with, for giving you these godly friends in your life. Turn with me to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 18. We can learn something from David and Jonathan's uh, friendship. And, you know, it's funny because <clears throat> as you're turning there, guys, we, got it, we have that perspective, right, of like, no, bro, like, I'm a man. Like, I don't love my friends. Like, I'm not a soft, right? We have that. Well, Anthony does. Anthony does, yeah. You know. <laughs> As he's actually, Anthony's probably like the soft heart, the, the most soft hearted ones out of all of the guys in this room. That's probably true. <laughs> Even though he's there like lifting, like, like, you know, you're at the gym lifting with Andrew, like, can yeah, confirm. can confirm. All the guys are like, yeah, that's accurate. It's true. Uh, but anyways, yes, that perspective, right? That the world tells you like, oh, you got to be like hard. Right? Let's look at this, this beautiful friendship that uh, David and Jonathan have together. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, starting verse 1. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. I mean, that was a huge honor to give him this armor. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. You know, the and it goes on throughout the account of David and Jonathan, you see this, this love that they have for one another, this care for one another. They cherish the friendship that they had. And in a lot of ways, this proved to be really fruitful for the life of David as he was constantly um, battling against Saul and all of his you know, attempts to kill David. This is, there's, there's so much we can learn from a, a friendship like this. We ought to cherish those type of friendships we got to thank God regularly for those type of friendships, for putting those people in your life. Thank God for that. Take that time to, to really thank God for the good friends that love the Lord for placing those people in your life. Don't take them for granted. My son has um, a friend, and uh, he calls him Papu. And uh, Esther laughs. She knows Papu. Yeah, so Papu is like his little stuffed animal thing, Right? My son is two. He's not like 12, okay? Like, he's two. Uh, and he loves Papu, right? And he tells me about Papu. And like, if Papu's crying, he tells me, Dad, Dad, Papu's crying. You know, it's like, okay, buddy, like, great. Uh, and he takes Papu everywhere he goes. And if he loses Papu, you know, this is, this is bad news, right? We got to get, we have nine Papus, by the way, at our house. <laughs> because if there's one lost, don't trust me. Papu is like, we got more. We're ready, okay? Because they cannot separate. And he, because he cherishes this thing. This is like, okay, he's got real life friends, guys. Okay, come on. Like you're thinking like, wow, what? that's so lame. No, okay. He's got real friends, but he also really likes this little stuffed animal. And it's funny because I find myself thanking God for Papu. I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. Like, thank you for this cool friend that Micah really, you know, cherishes it. And I praise God for uh, that, that relationship that they have, this fake, you know, imaginary relationship. But the point is, is that they're inseparable and he genuinely cares about this, this little thing, right? And he doesn't want to be separated from it. And in a lot of ways, they like hang out together and they do things together and it's helpful for him, right? This like friendship, it, you're doing that life together. And we ought to cherish those friendships that we have. Right? We ought to, to, to care about these, these good, godly friendships that, that God has put into our lives. And we'll talk more about that later. You're going to cherish these friendships. And you also need to capitalize on the opportunity to grow that circle of godly friendships. Because I think sometimes we get comfortable with, okay, I've, I have the one or I have the two uh, godly friends in my life, and we kind of shut everything else out. Instead, you ought to uh, grow and expand that, that circle of godly friendships. Capitalize on that. 
right? You go to a church that has a ministry like this that you can develop and grow these, these godly relationships with other people outside of the relationships that you already have. And that's not to say that you have to have a David and Jonathan relationship with every single Christian in this room, but that is to say that this is a great place to expand your relationships uh, for Christ. Because we'll talk about it later, why that's so important to have those good relationships. On the flip side, though, I think sometimes some of you may have the tendency to isolate, right? To shut yourself out, uh, out of those friendships, out of those relationships. But I, I really want to help you understand why that's a problem. You got to be open to making new friends. And sometimes we, we don't want to make those new friends and, and, you, and you feel like uh, you're, you're careful not to uh, open yourself to new friends because you have this heart of distrust towards other people. You have this, uh, this, this feeling that, uh, you know, I, I've been burned in the past, so I'm not going to open myself up, even to Christian people, right? Where that, need, that can't be the mentality that you have when you enter into new relationships. You have this heart of, uh, of fear into entering these new relationships. But ultimately, you got to make this fellowship a priority, right? Like, I mean, even thinking practically, you guys do a lot of fellowships. So you, you jump on the Discord and you guys have fellowships all the time. If you're the person that has a tendency to uh, avoid that time and uh, you know, kind of stick to yourself or stick to your own friends outside the group or whatever it may be, I, I would really encourage you to not do that. Get involved with the ministry. Get involved with the godly people that are in this group. And it uh, doesn't have to only be in this group, outside the group. But that's such a great opportunity that if you have a tendency to, to avoid those uh, times together, I'd encourage you to, to change that mentality, right? There's a lot of um, places that fellowship happens in our church, and you got to make that a priority. It, it's hard to preach this to you guys because you guys really kind of do a good job of this. You do. A lot of you do. But I, I think there are some of you in this room that don't prioritize this. And this is something that, that you need to, to focus on, that building this circle of godly friendships is so key for gospel advancement, which is what we'll talk about here in a bit. Yeah, I also want you to consider those friendships. Consider the friendships, not so much in this circle, but consider the friendships that you have. Anytime you talk about friendship, anytime a pastor is going to preach to you about friendship, you're going to hear the opposite side of what kind of friends do you have, right? You're going to have to think about these friends that you have. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. It says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. This is so important. Because in this, you know, especially, especially in your demographic, singles in your 20s and your early 30s, um, right, you, you're not married, you don't have kids. So there's this tendency, I think, to be a little bit more condoning of things you shouldn't condone with your friends. Doesn't mean you're partaking in the bad behavior, doesn't mean that you're, like, you're even cool with it, but you let it slide, Right? And bad company corrupts good morals. So think about the friends that you're with. Are they influencing you in a way that you know you shouldn't go down? Are you morally uh, being, are you being edified morally from this group? Like, are you growing in Christ from these people that you hang out with? Or are you not? Is it, is it harming your, your growth in Christ? Even, even like, Friendships that are, it's like Christian relationships that are morally uh, neutral. Like it doesn't increase or decrease. Like think about that. Are you, is, is that a good use of the time, the, the, the limited free time that you have? You know, a lot of you guys have your careers and you have serving posts in our church. So you have limited free time. Is, it, is, is that the right person to be hanging out with who is, is not edifying you, who's not growing you in Christ? They may not be pointing you in the wrong direction, but if you're not mutually edifying one another, is that, is that a helpful relationship? So I really want you to consider the relationships that you have. Are they honoring Christ? Are your friendships honoring Christ? 
All right, look back at our text. Let's see what Paul said again about the Philippians. As we see in verse 5, he says, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And then you jump down to 7 and 8, and he talks about partaking uh, with him in grace, both in his imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. The, the Philippians were uh, so supportive of Paul, and they were there for him, and they encouraged him, and they provided financial support, and they provided... Um, you know, gospel advancement uh, in, in their endeavors in the, the, the city of Philippi. And Paul really appreciated that about them. They partnered with Paul in this endeavor. And that was their goal. Their goal was to see the advancement of the kingdom. That's what the Philippians wanted. They were connecting with Paul in his missionary journey because they wanted people to get saved. They wanted the gospel to go out. That's what the purpose of their relationship was all about. So point number two, you got to pursue gospel advancement with your friends. Pursue gospel advancement with your friends. It's better to do this, of course, together. But can you advance the gospel one-on-one? Yeah, you share the gospel with someone. But basically the advancement of the gospel, now in Paul, just to, to help understand what Paul's talking about when he's saying, uh, uh, where he says, for you were partakers with me of grace, um, yeah, in the confirmation of the gospel. Yeah, and he said in verse five, that's what I'm looking for, because of your partnership in the gospel, right? So this obviously includes evangelism, right? This obviously includes sharing the gospel, but it's more of a neutral sense where it's like a category of gospel, right? There's a lot of ways that we can advance the gospel that's not just sharing the gospel, right? There's a lot of things that we can do partnering together as friends uh, and in in relationships to advance the gospel out into the world. That's not directly evangelism. And that uh, is accomplished through group, through a community, through friendships, okay? I'm an Angels baseball fan, which is very sad. I hear an audible, audible moan, like, are you serious? Like, you guys are like, yes, okay, I know, it is sad. It's very disappointing, and, and here's why. Because two of probably the, the best baseball players to ever play the game compared to like Babe Ruth are, or were on the Angels baseball team, right? Shohei Otani was there for three or four years, whatever it was, and he, now he's on the Dodgers, sadly. Um, and then Mike Trout, the, the loyal. That's, you know, that's a gospel partnership right there, man. That's a loyal man. He's loyal to the team, right? So he uh, is still around. But these are two of the best baseball players to ever play the game. That didn't do anything for the Angels to win a championship. They continued to lose. In fact, I don't even think they won a series in the playoffs. Like, someone fact check me on that. But they did not go far enough as they should have, right? And they had two of the best players to ever play baseball on the team. And it's not like the rest of the team were scrubs. Like, they were, they were okay, but the point is, is that those two people being on the same team together did not win them a championship. They didn't accomplish the goal that they set out when they signed those players to the Angels baseball uh, organization. It's the same type of idea when you think about uh, gospel advancement. Like, can you do something individually? Yeah, of course, we all have an individual responsibility to share the gospel. But are we going to reach our goal of advancing the gospel uh, into the nations? Not by ourselves not by ourselves. We need good godly people partnering together to advance the gospel, right? We need a a, a very good team of players, right? And that's where the godly people connecting uh, together to pursue gospel advancement is, is key. That's what friendships are intended for. That's what God designed friendships for. Now, there's a lot of good that comes out of friendships, right? It's, uh, you can have comfort, right? You can, uh, people are there to support. Um, you know, people are there to, to help you in times of need, to fulfill needs. Uh, and that doesn't directly advance the gospel. But I would argue that it, it's included in gospel advancement, right? Because when, when someone helps you through trial and supports you in times of need, it equips you and prepares you to get back out into the game, right? And start advancing the gospel again. So friendships are designed to, for the sake of, I should say, bring the gospel to people, to advance the gospel. 
That's what friendships are designed for. There's a lot of benefits to friendship. That's the reality. But ultimately, the end goal of our friendships as Christians is to couple together or to group together and to get the gospel out to the world. Like, that's what friendships are for. And I'll talk about various ways that we can advance the gospel. I want you to think about these aspects. I want you to think about the various aspects of advancing the gospel with your friends. I mean, think about just even serving together. Serving together. Like, how serving together will... um, it will further the gospel because you're serving uh, alongside one another in a ministry who has an end goal of reaching people with, for Christ, right? You're coupling up. I mean, a ministry cannot be run. Like, I, I can't lead every small group in this ministry and preach the sermon and set up the food and do, like, I'm not doing that by myself. Ser- we have people that are serving. We have your leaders that are here serving to equip you and to disciple you and to evangelize you and whoever else comes through this door, right? It's like we, we need the team to go out and do this. Serving together advances the gospel and you do that in a group. You do that with friends. Of course, evangelizing together. Going out door to door or um, even I want you to just imagine like when you, when you guys are all hanging out together and someone invites a friend typically you're not the only person that's trying to reach this person for Christ. It's kind of a group effort. And it's not like seven of you are jumping on the opportunity at once and like, let's get this person saved tonight. You know, <laughs> I hope you're not doing that. I mean, that, yeah, that's aggressive. But, uh, but you, you, you understand what I'm saying, right? Like imagine those, you've been in those situations where you guys have hung out and an unbeliever comes or it's like, hey, my friend's coming, you know, like, Let's see if we can start the conversation. It's like, you, you know that conversation that I'm talking about, right? And it's a group effort. It's like, okay, we're all in this together because we know that this is the most important thing for this person is for them to know Christ. You're advancing the gospel together as friends. Of course, personal discipleship. I just imagine, I know a few of you guys have taken uh, someone in this room um, through partners, Partners our one-on-one discipleship program at our church. Uh, Personal investment, personal discipleship. This happens through good friends seeking to advance the gospel. That personal one-on-one discipleship where you have a Christian who wants to grow and learn more, and then you have a Christian who is equipped to teach and to disciple and to lead them more in Christ. This advances the gospel because it equips people with the knowledge of the word. As Paul even mentions down in verse 9, uh, the knowledge and discernment, it grows us in that, in that personal discipleship, and it leads people to be more equipped to get the gospel out. The last one I'll mention is uh, hospitality. Hospitality, how does this aspect advance the gospel? But it, it, it kind of goes back to what I mentioned where, you know, when you open up the door to your home and you guys have these group nights and you hang out and friends are invited and now you have uh, because of this, this door, this open door of hospitality or this, I should say, um, like your commitment to be faithful and, ho- and, and do hospitality, to exercise hospitality, opens a door for the gospel to advance. It opens a door for people to get saved or people to get sanctified because it, it, it starts conversations or it, um, you know, initiates this one-on-one discipleship. Do you see how all of these aspects, they're not necessarily like just telling someone the gospel, like how all of these aspects can come together to advance the kingdom, to advance the gospel. And this happens through you partnering with your friends in this endeavor, making this a primary focus, because this is, is the primary focus of your friendships. This is what you should be thinking. This is the primary goal, is how can we edify one another and how can we get people saved? Like that's how what you guys should be mutually doing with your friends. That's how you should be thinking with your friends. Leads me to think of this, there's two groups in the church that, um, yeah, I'll just say, there's, there's people that are consumers and then there's people that are outright servants. The people in Philippi, Paul's praising them because they were so faithful to do whatever was necessary to, to advance the gospel. They were so faithful to Paul in whatever he needed. But 
That's not the case with every single person in the church. And that might even be true of some of you, that there are consumers in the church where you come, you show up, you, you take, and then you go. Where instead, we need to be connecting with people. We need to be developing these relationships so that the gospel can go out. Don't be a, a, a consumer in the church. Spurgeon says it this way. I love the way he says it. He says, in most churches, there are a few who, to a large extent, do everything and give everything. This is the, the, Phil, the Philippians. Another portion assists occasionally, so far as they are urged on by the consecrated ones. After these, you find a large number who are practically the baggage of the church, the lumber that has to be carried by the efficient members. I think it's good. I mean, it's convicting in a lot of ways, right? I mean, we can always do more. But if you're a consumer, if you're a person that comes and you hear the message and then you, you fill your head and then you leave and you, you get in your car and you go home, right, you're, you're, you're consuming. Are you connecting? Are you engaging in relationships in your ministry here in Alliance? Are you serving in the church, right? Are you giving to the church? Are you uh, committed to fulfilling the needs of people in your church, right? Or do you, do you want to see the gospel go out? Because that type of mentality of consuming and taking and taking and not serving, that's the mentality is you just want to build yourself up and puff your head up and you, and you don't want to pour it out. I think we got to be warned against that. The people in Philippi, they're servants. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 says, uh, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. That's what a good friend does. Right, You exhort one another. How can you grow? How can you do good? How can you become more like Christ? Become the friend who stirs one another on. Get involved. Don't be a consumer. Get involved in the advancement of the gospel with your friends. All right, in these final three verses, we see Paul's prayer. Paul gives us this, uh, this prayer for the people, for the sanctification of the people. We see Paul's heart for the people, for his friendships, for, uh, you know, the people that he's partnering in the gospel with. We see this love that he has for these people. He longs to see them grow. He longs to see them sanctified. He longs to see them uh, grow in Christ-likeness, and we need to do the same exact thing. So point number three, I want you to pray for the sanctification of your friends. Pray for the sanctification of your friends. Imagine you had a button, <clears throat> and this button sat in your kitchen dining room table, and every time you press this button, something good happened to your friend, right? Like, bam, press a button, job promotion, right? Like, bam, press it again, you know, successful work uh, presentation, right? Bam, happened again, you know, the girl said yes for the date, Right? <laughs> Anthony laughs. That's who I had in mind when I was thinking about this. <laughs> Boom, Anthony gets accepted for on a date. Yes. Hit the... <laughs> Just kidding. Anthony's been on many dates. Anthony's the butt of my jokes tonight. I'm sorry, buddy. I, I love you. Anthony, I love you, bro. Uh, I do it for the advancement of the gospel, Anthony. That's what I do, you know. <sighs> you know, but think about it. Like, like, you know, bam, you know, your car has no, many pr no more problems. Right? Like, wouldn't that be great? It's like someone press that button. <laughs> All the good things that can happen from uh, just this imaginary button that you press from your friends. Uh, but sometimes we see that button on the kitchen counter and we don't want to do anything with it. We just kind of pass by the kitchen counter. Just want you to imagine that for a second. You don't press it every single time. You're like, ah, I don't have time to press the button today, right? Oh, I don't, I just, I don't really care to press the button today. Like my friends will be fine, right? Every single one of us has this metaphorical button, and it's called prayer. That's not to say that we pray for our friend to get the job promotion and bam, press the button and it happens, right? But it is to say that if you're praying for the sanctification of your friends, that's a prayer that God promises he will answer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says, Verse 16 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of uh, God in Christ Jesus for you. This is the will of God. 
He later says, that the will of God is your sanctification in 1 Thessalonians 4. Right? And then it says in 1 John chapter 5, it says, and this is the confidence, verse 14, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, and this is the confidence that we have toward you, toward him rather, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. I sandwich these together because God says that your sanctification is his will. And whatever you ask that aligns with the will of God, he is faithful to answer. You have this magical fairy tale button. If you pray for the sanctification of your friends, and yet we neglect doing that. I mean, I'm, I'm a victim of this, right? I don't have my friend's spiritual needs on a prayer list. Conv- I was convicted by this, and I need to start doing this. But every single one of us should have on our prayer list the sanctification needs of our friends. And God is faithful to answer that. Like, are you, are you hearing me here? Are you well, hearing the Bible? Are you hearing the Bible? Like, if you pray for your friend to, to grow in Christ-likeness, he's going to grow in Christ-likeness if, if they're a genuine believer, right? right? If you pray for your friend to, uh, you know, to overcome you know, anxiety, it's going to happen. Like, this is the will of God, their sanctification. We should be pressing this button often. We should be pressing this button almost every single day, if not every day. This is a prayer that God will always answer. Is this on your prayer list? Is this on your prayer list? Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. And really, this is one of so many examples that Paul, all throughout his letters, he's just constantly saying, pray for us, pray for us, pray for us. Or we're praying for you, we're praying for you, we're praying for this. He says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Do you pray for your friends? Is that on your prayer list? Is your friend's sin struggle, is your friend's growth in Christ, is that on your prayer list? If you don't have a prayer list, start a prayer list. That mark number one, you know, it's May 5th, number one, pray for the sanctification of XYZ friend. Hebrews chapter four, verse 16 This is such a beautiful passage about what prayer looks like. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That we can draw near, not only can we draw near to the throne, but we can do it confidently because of Christ. We can have this confidence to go before the Father and ask Him things, and petition on behalf of our friends. And God will hear that, receive that, and respond rightly to that. God promises. There's so much in the Bible. There's not a lot where we can say like, like if I pray for this, like it will happen. Like it's hard. It's hard to think like, you know, it's always up to what God wants to do. But there, there are a handful of places where we can, like God's promised us he'll answer the prayer. And this is one of them. I think that's awesome. I think that's really a great thing. And we can confidently go before the throne to ask God these things for the sanctification, the growth, the spiritual growth of our friends. But there's one thing about this whole process, about praying for our friends' spiritual growth. You can't be faithfully doing that unless you're, you know the spiritual growth of your friend, right? You can't be faithfully praying for their spiritual growth if you're not knowledgeable of the things that they're dealing with or the things that they're going through or this, you know, this, the maturity level of their, uh, their walk with Christ. You have to worry and care about your friend's spiritual growth, right? It's so easy, I think, sometimes to just hang out and talk about, you know, the thing that happened, you know, in the current event or uh, talk about theology even or talk about, but like, are you getting real with your friend? Are you asking them, hey, how are you doing in your walk with Christ? Say, hey, I know you had mentioned something about this sin struggle. I haven't followed up with you on that. I've been praying for that. How is that going? Are you 
intentionally seeking to connect with your friends in this intimate level. This is so key with our friendships. If we're going to partner in advancing the gospel with our godly friends, we need to know what they're dealing with. We need to know where they're at. And you need to be open also on the flip side to, being, to talking about those things. Like you need to care about talking about those things. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6. It's a little bit out of context, at least the principle, but it's helpful, I think. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Right? The principle I'm trying to pull out of this is like, we need to be uh, going past the superficiality of uh, our conversations with friends. And it really needs to dive deeper. It needs to dive deeper. Where are you at with Christ? You got to be open to discussing these things. You can't faithfully pray for your sanctification if, if you're not intimate and open with your friendships. And now, like I said earlier about, you know, we got to trust people and open up our circles and things like that. I'm not saying that you divulge all of your deep, dark secrets and sanctification and sin struggles and things like that to every single person in the room. That's unwise, right? But your buddy, your girlfriend, whatever, like, girl, like girls, you friends, not your girlfriend. Uh, like girls, guys, right? You have that intentional, um, intimate, and, uh, you know, real and deep conversations with your friends about where you're at with Christ. Where are you growing in Christ? You can't faithfully pray for these things unless you do that. You got to check in on your friends. And then also... Uh, having that accountability is so key in your friendships. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, it says, But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Exhort one another every day. Hold one another accountable. You're going to grow in Christ-likeness if you're faithful to open yourself up to another brother or sister in Christ and have that accountability. It's so easy for you to justify your sin or to justify your um, complacency in your walk with Christ without accountability. It's so easy. In other words, I I want you to imagine like a sin struggle that you're going with, like, oh, I don't need to talk to, you know, I don't need to talk to whoever about that. It's like, I'm good. Everything's okay. It's like, I can deal with this in my own time. And we're so quick to justify the sin before God and and pretend like we're going to deal with it. And in reality, we never do. So having that accountability is so key in these, in, you know, your, your sanctification. It doesn't necessarily always have to be about like sin problem, sin problem, sin problem, but also like, are you growing in Christ or are you being complacent? Which I think is, a, is also a sin problem, but it, it doesn't have to be a direct sin issue that you're struggling with. It, it, it's also accountability in the sense that let's, let's stir one another on to love and good deeds like we quoted in Hebrews chapter 10. So it works in both ways. Have that accountability. Be faithful, ultimately, like I said, to knowing each other's spiritual walks and being open to talk about where you're at with Christ and talk about your struggles and to talk about what you need help with. There's, there's so much in this room of people that uh, have strengths that you are weak in or weaknesses that you have that someone has strengths in and vice versa, all those things, right? That people can help you when you are willing to invest and to pour into one another and to be open with one another. This helps the church grow. And if we can grow as a ministry, if we can grow individually, the church will strengthen, right? See this as a bigger picture than yourself. The gospel will advance in a quicker fashion, if you will, in a more powerful fashion if the church is strengthened. And it starts with like quite literally a one-on-one conversation of you being open with this other brother and sister in Christ about where you're at. Are you following me, right? Right? That one-on-one intimate conversation can literally advance the kingdom in the, in the big picture. 
Because it's a step-by-step process. You grow in Christ, and then you're edified, and then you edify another person, and then that person gets confidence to share the gospel, and then that person gets saved, and then that person uh, shares the gospel with another person. It, the small aspects of discipleship and accountability leads to the, the kingdom growing. Like it's, a, it's a big deal, and, and we take it for granted. I think sometimes we take it lightly. It strengthens the church. Well, like I said at the beginning, um, a lot of our f- focus when we were kids was, uh, was friendships, building those friendships, right? That's what we cared so much about, um, was making friends. Um, well, I don't think we've changed much today. You know, we grow older and we pretend like it's less important, but like we still care about fitting in. You know, we still care about making friends. We still care about having good conversations with people. And but those, are, those are still important things to us. And it's because God designed us that way. Right? And as Christians, our friendships are intended to have this higher purpose. It's intended to advance the gospel. It's intended to grow in Christ-likeness. We got to learn from Paul in this regard. As we see the opening section of this letter, it helps prepare us for the rest of what he has. But just having that gratitude for our friendships having that thankfulness uh, to our friends, um, that's, that's one step closer to being content with joy uh, in the life that, that we live on a daily basis is, is showing gratitude for those gospel-centered friendships that we have. So I do, I want you to appreciate those friends that are striving alongside you for the sake of the gospel. So let's pray about that and we'll have a small group. God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this letter that's so helpful for us, as is, of course, the rest of your word, the direct words from you, God. We're just so thankful that you recorded it for us to learn from and to grow in, and I pray that these small groups are fruitful, that they're helpful, and God, that ultimately we can see our friendships in new light with a new perspective tonight, and that something practical can come from this that we can apply into our lives. pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.